today we have the third lecture by David McNutt. So please. Okay. So um, after my last lecture, I uh, I made two changes. I decided never to do a handwritten lecture again, um, but I made a subtle shift. I had promised to talk about Kerr, and it came to me that there's actually something a little more accessible for 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 uh, people that don't do this sort of thing, and so. That's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, it's an actually very interesting result. It's about 30 years old now, but uh, yeah. So this is the third talk. We're going to take what I talked about last time with spinners, and we're going to apply it to the cartan carlini algorithm now. And this will lead us into the alignment classification. So this is how I'm going to break it up. We'll talk about a little bit more about spinners. We're going to talk about spinner transformations, covariant derivatives, and how we can generate a, a curvature spinner. Um, and use the NP formalism. I will then apply it to, this is where my change is, to vacuum type N spacetimes. So these would describe radiative uh, solutions to Einstein field equations. And we'll, we'll go very briefly through how we could use the Cartan classification, uh, Cartan Carlini algorithm to classify these. And this will naturally lead us into the alignment classification because we're going to see tensors that don't have a canonical form. Okay, um, so let's come back to spinners. Uh, now this is nice and handwritten. So we have a spin basis and uh, Omicron and Iota. Um, we're asking that our symplectic uh, product of the two or symplectic um, form is one. So they're under this bracket. And under SP1, uh, the transformations we have here are uh, boost and spins. Um, these are my own terminology, but they'll be a little more clear in a second. Uh, and then we have uh, translations of, so kind of the way I think about it is a rotation around Omicron and uh, a rotation around IOTA. And when we're doing the Petrov classification of wild spinners, these are the transformations we're using when we take our principal spinner and aligning it with our spin basis, so Omicron or IOTA in, in some way. So we can use these transformations to align the spin frame with our wild spinner, as we've seen before. And we can either use the infeld van der uh, Vauden symbols, or we can use this nice little prescription down in equation one to generate um, two null directions, L and N, and two complex spatial directions. Uh, so we're, we're taking our spinners and we're just sticking them together to make Hermitian forms, and we get our vectors and covectors. Um, so index up is is a vector. Uh, nope, that's 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 a one form, and index down is a vector. Um, so uh, again, I want to remind you that here it's very different from what I normally use. I use negative plus plus plus. Here the signature is switched to go with what Newman and Penrose talk about. So this would be plus minus minus minus, and this can be encapsulated into the way the metric is diagonalized. And if we take our transformations from the spinner world and bring it over to the vector world, we have exactly what I would call a boost and a spin. So we're boosting in the null directions with the magnitude of lambda, and we're rotating our complex uh, plane with um, theta. So this would be the normal rotations. Um, but there's a factor of two. And those rotations around Omicron and Iota become null rotations about L and N. So these leave the metric invariant. This is the Lorentz transformations, or SO13, the, uh, the connected part. So these are the corresponding transformations we'd actually work with if we wanted to um, do the Petrov classification for the wild tensor. Um, not the most pleasant way to work with it. In fact, spinners are preferable, but we, we can do this, and people do prefer it sometimes. So I, I really want to just start out with this and put it into a, the, the, the foreground. Um, but now I'm going to actually go on and talk about how we can differentiate spinners. So we have a recipe. We, we want to differentiate a spinner. And if we have some spinners, so um, here phi, theta, and psi are spinner fields, we're going to ask that theta and phi have the same valence. So they're in the same kind of vector space. We can add them together. 
um, we're going to introduce a spinner covariant derivative, and we have a recipe for this. So the first thing is it should be linear in terms of what we're um, differentiating. It should satisfy the Leibniz rule. Um, it should respect complex conjugation of the spinners. Um, this eta AB, which is coming from the, the symplectic form, uh, is covariantly constant. Here, I've written it as little x just because it gets tedious to write xx prime. Um, but that is actually something important is it should take a spinner and a, a conjugate spinner index, so a prime and unprimed index uh, in a sensible way, because we want to bring this back to vectors. Um, but continuing on, it commutes with any index substitution that doesn't involve x or x prime. It's, uh, it's torsion free. So we have the nice kind of, it, it almost acts like differentiation and for any derivation. So that is something that it annihilates the constant scalars and it satisfies the Leibniz rule. So we have any other sort of derivation, then there's some sort of spinner I can find. So here, uh, zeta, such that I can write that derivation as my covariant derivative contracted with this spinner. And it's a Hermi, um, well, We'll just say it's a Hermitian spinner here. Uh, David, sorry, just yes. one thing. Um, sure. You mentioned Leibniz rule, but uh, what's what's your product on uh, what? What do you mean by theta psi in the in the second equation? Uh, so here, tensor product. Ah, tensor product. Okay. Yeah. 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 So yeah, Leibniz like multiplication. Sorry. I, uh, thank you. Good question. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So yeah, this this identifies a four D vector space of Hermitian spinners, and we can identify that with the tangent space. Uh, at a point in the manifold. And correspondingly, we have their dual, and that makes the cotangent space at a point. And the good news is, is this exists, and it's unique. Um, it's basically Levi-Civita. Uh, so Penrose and Rindler had proven this in their book, 1984, I think it was when it was published, pretty sure. Uh, and this is this can be found in section 4.4. .4. It's, it's, it's dense, so that's all I'm going to say about it. Uh, so... We have a derivative, and I want to go and make a little detour into frame fields so that I have a nice analogy. So a frame field or a tetrad is, is one way to compute the curvature tensor. It's one of my favorite ways. Um, but what we're going to do is introduce a, a tetrad of vectors. And here I is, uh, we're labeling the covectors or vectors, and A is just some arbitrary basis. Uh, and for a tetrad of vectors, we have a Wielbin. We can also have a dual. So this would be um, uh, a basis of covectors. And because it's dual, we have this equation that if we contract our i and j indices, in this case i, uh, we get a delta ab. So th the identity matrix, they're inverses of each other. And instead of levi civita or like the Christoffel symbols, we're going to formulate this in terms of the Ricci, uh, Ricci rotation coefficients. So this is given in equation six, and it's just a prescription for picking out the connection coefficients within it all indices down in terms of covariant differentiation of the tetrad fields and appropriately contracting. Um, so these have frame indices, i, j, k. And nabla here is Levi-Civita. And we can do further. We have the Ricci identity, Ricci identity sorry, um, given in equation seven. And what I like about these identities is we can replace, replace each A, B, C, D with capital A, capital A prime, and bring this over to the spinner world. So what we're going to do is introduce spinner dyads. Uh, so this is an epsilon I, A. Capital I is going to be our, our chosen frame basis. Capital A will be some arbitrary basis that we're working with. Uh, appropriately, you know, up or down, it doesn't matter. Uh, so for example, here, I'm going to say zero is Omicron, one is A, um, Iota, and we again have some sort of like dual product. Um, they're, they're dual to each other, so their inner product in this way gives us something that, it, it looks like epsilon, but it's, it's delta in this form. And so we have the spinner Ricci rotation coefficients, uh, and we've just taken our form, uh, the connection we, we have, it is Levi-Civita, but it's now a spinner connection. And we've just replaced our letters with uh, capital letters in pairs. And with, you know, it, it looks ugly and, and it is, uh, but we'll make it a little nicer here. But 
we can compute the curvature tensor using this formalism. So in the first equation, we've just, we've kind of taken our analogy from tetrads and brought it over to the spinner world. And that we, we can expand this out. So what we have is this last identity here, CC means complex conjugate. Um, I'm leaving my covariant derivatives here with little subscripts because it get, gets quite messy and there's quite a bit of work here, but I just wanted to give the end result. Um, so what we have is the curvature spinner with all of its indices. So that's um, four primed indices, four unprimed indices can be written in this form. Uh, so there's some sort of complex number plus it's complex conjugate because we would like it to be um, Hermitian. Um, and here we have the Delambelt or Delambeltian operator. And here it, it's complex. So we also have a complex conjugate. So in primed indices, and it's just a symmetrization and uh, summation over here for the, the one with the unprimed indices, we're summing over the primed indices. And for this quantity with primed indices, we're summing over the unprimed indices. Um, so again, looks it looks terrible uh, because it is, uh, but we can make this a little easier and bring it back to what we know in, in GR. Um, so the first term is symmetric in C and D and it's symmetric in A and B. It takes a little more work to show it's symmetric in A and B, but it can be done. And so we have our lemma from before that says if we have two indices, uh, we can always write that as some sort of symmetric product minus a trace term. And here, this term, the very first term, can actually be written as the Weyl spinner, as we saw before, and then this quantity lambda, which is a scalar. Um, so here we can actually even define it even better in equation 11, where we have a formal definition of the levy civi um, uh, sorry, oof, uh, the Weyl spinner and some sort of scalar that's coming from contractions of this. Now, that's the good news. The bad news is, is the other piece can't be written in this way. We can't quite exploit the lemma in the same way. And that's because it has two primed indices and two unprimed indices. And this thing I'll talk about on the next slide, but the best we can do is write it like this. And in very certain cases, can it kind of be broken apart into primed and unprimed quantities that we can work with individually. But what we can do now is write the curvature tensor in this way, or pardon me, curvature spinner. And we have psi, the vowel spinner. We have this quantity, a scalar. It will be proportional to the um, Ricci scalar. And then we have this piece and then complex conjugates. And we're going to use our analogy to, to differential geometry uh, to, to vectors here to actually relate some things. So this thing can be related back to the curvature tensor. And we have the Bianchi identities for the curvature tensor when we're using the levitz civita connection. And using that, we can actually show that, well, lambda here is real valued. And whatever this phi spinner is, it is Hermitian. And if we contract two indices, we have kind of the, the, the Ricci spinner, uh, that's perfectly okay to say, but we recover that lambda here is proportional to the Ricci scalar, and phi is actually the trace-free Ricci, uh, Ricci tensor. Um, so that's okay. We, we know what those quantities are. We have the vial uh, spinner, which gives us the vial tensor in a sensible way. So we, we already have a dictionary between these two words, um, these, these two quantities. Finally, we have maybe the most important part for us, the differential Bianchi identities. And here we can relate them into um, spinorial quantities in a very nasty way. Um, well, I've had to work with these. I don't like them. I prefer uh, the vector quantities. Um, these are rather clunky at working in this way. One has to keep track of A and Bs and Cs and Ds and primed indices. It's, it's quite, it can be quite tricky to work with. Um, what is more natural to do is to go to a chosen spin dyad and then make an appropriate Newman-Penrose frame. So we're going to do that. This is the Newman-Penrose formalism. 
So what we're going to do is rewrite all of our quantities using a particular Newman Penrose frame and associated derivatives. So for each um, L, N, M, and, and oh goodness, uh, it didn't quite register. Um, so delta here is a complex derivative and its conjugate would also um, could be written here in equation 19. I must've missed that. Um, but we can go to the Ricci rotation coefficients, spinorial or vectorial. And here in equation 20, we get a nice little um, transcription between the two. So here in the first line, we have the spinorial Ricci rotation coefficients. In the next row, we have the um, vectorial versions of these. And what, are, what we're doing here is with nabla b, we're replacing it with either d delta lowercase delta or lowercase delta bar. And that would be contracting our b index with l, n, m, or m bar. And so we have 24 complex quantities here. Um, they're very nice symbols uh, to keep track of, you know, just some Greek letters. Uh, these are known, known as the NP spin coefficients. And we could also, because we have a torsion-free connection, write down the commutators of uh, the derivations of D capital delta, little delta, and little delta bar. I won't show them here, but we can write them in terms of the spin coefficients. And we have this list of guys. So here we're actually writing down the components of the trace v Ricci uh, tensor or spinner. And that here we're just keeping track of how many iotas we have. So whether primed or unprimed, that's why we have two subscripts in, in phi here. And so phi zero zero means we have no omicrons whatsoever. Uh, phi one one means we have iota unprimed and iota primed, it's, it's conjugate and so on. And similarly, we, we have the vial spinner components. And in an appropriate way, we can also say that these are the components of the vial tensor, or rather the self-dual vial tensor, which I will give a definition of that in a bit. Now, we could write down the Ricci equations, Ricci equations, or uh, as they're commonly called in the Newman Penrose, uh, Penrose formalism, the NP field equations, and the Bianchi identities in terms of these quantities. I have made the decision not to, and to instead show you an example and write them down because they become smaller. Um, so what I'm going to do is actually talk about a very large example. Uh, this was done by Collins in 1991. Um, we're going to talk about vacuum type and space times. Type here means Petrov type. So that means vacuum means we're turning off the Ricci uh, tensor. Um, goodness, uh, lambda should also be zero. Um, that didn't register for some reason. And we're also going to choose a canonical form for our vial spinner. So here, because it's Petrov type N, that means we can pick psi four as the only non-zero component and the remaining spinner components are zero. So psi zero, psi one, psi two, and psi three. It's a very simple example that surprisingly is difficult to work with. In fact, I would say that non-vacuum type N space times are easier to work with than vacuum. So we're, we're using a lot of our uh, frame freedom is what I'll call. So we're, we're, we're fixing parameters of SO13 if we're thinking of vectors or of SP1 if we're thinking of spinners. And all we have left now is boost and spins and a null rotation around Omicron. Um, we're going to use our boost and spins to basically fix psi4 to be 1. So now all of our freedom that's left that we have in choosing our frame is in um, transformations where Omicron is fixed. And this would correspond to null rotations about the L vector. Now, in this case, this is why I picked it. The Bianchi identities become very, very simple. We just have conditions on the spin coefficients. So kappa is zero, sigma is zero, and the spin coefficients epsilon and beta can be written in terms of rho and tau. So this is very nice, this is very simple. Um, 
Unfortunately, the, the, the field equations or the Ricci equations um, are a little nasty. And I've just, I, I apologize. This is the only time I've cheated. I took them from um, Colin's paper just because they're, they're, they're quite detailed. Um, so the equations here don't quite line up. I apologize for that. Um, but what we have is a set of equations uh, that's uh, in some sense our integrability. So if, if, if we have a solution that works, all of these equations are satisfied and they're in terms of the frame derivatives of the spin coefficients. Uh, these can be very useful if, if, if you think you have a solution, you can integrate it out and maybe actually find an explicit example of the metric in some sense. People often do this. Um, for example, um, there is an open question in the cartanker lidi algorithm about upper bounds. Uh, so it is possible that you, you come up with a prescription in the cartanker lidi algorithm. It says, okay, these components have to be a certain thing. And I will talk about this a bit more. So you get some sort of prescription for your spin coefficients, uh, your NP curvature scalars. And then the question is, is does that actually have a valid solution? And you would go to the Bianchi identities and the NP field equations and try to integrate it out to find a solution. This is actually what Kerr did when he found his, uh, his, the, the Kerr black hole. He was just playing around with algebraically special solutions, uh, type D in this case, that's a little different, and integrating out the field equations to find the Kerr black hole. Uh, I'm making it sound really easy. It is actually quite a feat. Um, but this is how we would do it, is using this, this mess of equations. And I will add that this is in a very special case. This is vacuum. So the Ricci trace-free tensor is zero, lambda is zero, and this is type N. So we only have one component of the vial tensor or vial spinner. Uh, and they become quite worse if, if we look at full generality. Okay. Now, th there are some famous classes within this. So in the type N subclasses, vacuum type N, I, should, I, I really want to be clear here. Uh, we have the PP wave metrics. So these are the plane parallel waves. Uh, these were discovered by Kunt and Ehlers, I think 1956. Goodness, I should know this. Um, but they describe, they're a toy model for gravitational waves. And they can be described in a kinematic way, talking about spin coefficients, as uh, there is an all direction where rho is zero and tau is zero. Now, if you turn off tau, it's, um, you get something called a Kunt wave or a rotating plane fronted wave. Uh, so again, rho is zero. There is a null direction where rho is zero, but tau is non-zero. Again, this is a kinematic definition, but we will actually show that, that is, this is an honest to goodness invariant definition as well. Uh, next, uh, and kind of in, in increasing complexity are the Robinson-Troutman metrics. And uh, these um, have expansion. So rho is non-zero, but they're not twisting. So the imaginary part of rho is zero. Finally, and maybe the most complicated case is the twisting case where rho is non-zero and the imaginary part of rho is not zero. So that is what we would call twist. And in the vacuum case, weirdly enough, they're very difficult to find. The only metric we have as an example of this is the Hauser metric. Uh, so this is the only explicit metric we have of a twisting vacuum type N spacetime. Uh, people kind of cheat. So for example, uh, Norowski found a really, actually it's, it's not cheating, it's totally cool, um, examples of twisting type N spacetimes with a cosmological constant. But they're very, very hard to find. Uh, be, it, it's the structure of, of the Bianchi identities and the Ricci identities that make it so hard to do. Um, yeah. So please keep these in mind. We're, we're going to go forward. And the reason I'm talking about this is Collins, without actually kind of identifying these metrics, uh, he did know about the Hauser metric, takes these and applies the cartanker lidi algorithm and gives an upper bound on how many derivatives we need to compute to classify any of these solutions. Uh, so this is a very practical thing. So of course, I'm obligated to again, give the Kurt-Ankerly algorithm. And 
we can kind of place ourselves in this step. So we've already done Q is equal to zero. We computed the Val spinner. Uh, we don't care about the Ricci spinner or um, curvature tensor. We can think about this in terms of tensors, but we'll keep it for, in spinners for now. Uh, we fix the frame as much as possible. We've chosen the vial type N form. And we know what our invariance group is. I've said it. I haven't explicitly said it yet, but I have said it um, with words. And that is null rotations about L, or in the spinner language, transformations that leave Omicron fixed. Now, the other steps I won't talk about very much for now, but we would find the number of functionally independent components. And then we would keep iterating this algorithm. Um, so Collins does this. I won't talk about it very much. I'm more interested in these practical details of finding canonical forms right now. Uh, these steps are just computational. Um, it's just taking exterior derivatives and then appropriate wedge products to see how many functionally independent components you have. Six, again, is the stopping condition. So six is saying that um, is when the algorithm stops. So if you have two iterations where I have the same number of functionally independent components and the linear isotropy group, uh, this invariance group, HQ, doesn't change dimension, the algorithm tells you to stop. You have all the information you need. And once the algorithm stops, you have a frame. You have two discrete sequences of, uh, sorry, you have two sequences of integers, and you have a, a set of components of the curvature tensor and its covariant derivatives up to order um, p plus one. And those are Cartan variants. Those, the components of those tensors are Cartan variants, and you can use them for classification. OK, so we have to go to the next derivative. Um, so the, uh, at this step, um, in, in Colin's paper, uh, we haven't fixed the isotropy group any further. We, we still have two degrees of freedom. And so we have to compute the first covariant derivative. And I've decided um, I, there's a known result by Penrose from, I think, uh, Annals of Physics in 1960, which says all of the covariant derivatives can be reframed as symmetric products, um, symmetric spinners. I've decided not to do that and to work with Collins formalism. So here is the expression of the covariant derivative of the vial spinner. And using the Leibniz rule, I can rewrite it like this as an equation 22, the second equation. And what's nice about this is I can actually count how many iotas appear. And this breaks it down into three cases that we can examine very quickly. And here, with a little more work, I can rewrite this in terms of derivatives of psi four, which we know is one, so they don't really actually appear, and the Ricci rotation coefficients um, in terms of NP uh, multiplied by the vial scalars. Here, I've left them just totally general, but when we specify to our vacuum type N um, space times, the co first covariant derivatives are actually very nice we actually find that the components of the covariant derivative of the vial spinner are rho, alpha, tau, and gamma. So these are spin coefficients, but now relative to this frame, they are also Cartan variants, which is always a strange thing to say every time. I'm getting used to this, but I still get trouble saying that they are invariants. Um, and now we have to start thinking about how we can fix these. Um, but I'm going to do a little bit more. I'm going to talk about the covariant, uh, second covariant derivative. This is quite ugly. Um, and so maybe this is, I'm using this right now to motivate the fact that we want to avoid taking covariant derivatives. We would like to know when we can stop taking covariant derivatives. And I feel like the second covariant derivative really illustrates this. So here again, we have the form of the second covariant derivative of the vial spinner. And we can use Leibniz rule to rewrite this. And in this case, again, we can rewrite this in terms of the Ricci rotation coefficients and earlier expressions of the first covariant derivative of the Vile spinner. Um, again, this kind of lends itself to a really good hand calculation. It's a really good computational tool, despite the, the um, massive amount of indices. 
when I was a first a PhD student, this was my job to do this by hand. And you actually get very nice expressions. So here we have again, the first order Cartan variants coming up. So we have rho and tau, alpha and gamma. We also have their frame derivatives. So this would be differentiation with respect to L. Here we have differenti differentiation with respect to M bar, um, M and N. Um, these are all just first order Cartan variants. Uh, they're frame derivatives. But we also get more spin coefficients coming in. So for example, here we have um, pi, which didn't appear at first order, uh, lambda, mu, and this gradually saturates. Um, so this is, the, the other reason I want to show this is, is the utility of fixing uh, the frame. And so how do we do that? For example, maybe I'd really like to get rid of tau if, if I can. That would really simplify things. Suddenly, this term would go away, this term would go away, uh, this term would go away. The, so three, zero prime. Anyway, I, I'll just use my cursor instead of listing off the indices. So it would be really good if we could use our remaining frame freedom to simplify this, because suddenly all of these equations could take a simpler form. Um, well, we're going to just look at how the first order um, Cartan variants transform. And these are spin coefficients. Um, so these will affect the higher orders as well. Um, so at zeroth order, we have already exhausted most of our frame freedom. We only have here in equation 29 uh, transformations that leave Omicron invariant. So this leaves our type N condition unchanged. If we do this transformation, psi zero up to psi three are still zero, psi four is still one, and nothing changes. And the effect of this transformation on the, let's say, first order spin coefficients is nothing happens to rho. Uh, alpha is now a, a linear equation in terms of our B parameter, the null rotation parameter times rho. Similarly, tau is. And we have, oh uh, goodness, this A should be a B, I apologize. A, a quadratic expression in terms of B and its complex conjugate. So we can use these, right? We, we can actually simplify this. And this is what Colin did. Colin's, pardon me, uh, looked at all the possible cases. So for example, we see that if, if rho is zero, suddenly we can no longer fix alpha or tau and we're only left with playing around with gamma. And so he examined each of these cases and he, he played the game of, okay, well, let me say that there are two functionally independent invariants or three functionally independent variants. So he, he took, I'm, I'm apologizing here, but I'm gonna scroll back a bit. He took this algorithm and he, he essentially traced out the worst cases. So the worst cases would be where um, the number of functionally independent invariants uh, don't come in for a long time. So it, perhaps at zeroth order, we have one functionally independent invariant and we can't fix our isotropy. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm kind of detouring here. I don't want to say too, too much, but he's using the Cartan-Carlini algorithm and what he knows about just the transformation rules of the vacuum type N solutions. And what he finds is actually very interesting. Um, maybe for me, because this is what my, uh, the last topic of my PhD thesis was on. Um, but he comes up with five classes. So in the first class here, type I, we have the robinson troutman solutions. We have the Hauser metrics, um, the, the type N vacuum spacetimes with twist, all live in case I. And the next two, 2A two and 2B, we have PP waves. Uh, because tau is non-zero, but rho is zero. And type 2b is the um, plane parallel, um, the homogeneous plane waves. So these are very, very simple toy models. Um, and then finally, we have the Kunt waves that are also broken into two subclasses. And again, we're talking about spin coefficients here. We're talking about connection coefficients. 
but they are actually Cartan variants in the frame we've chosen. And so these conditions in terms of the spin coefficients are actual honest to goodness invariant conditions. Um, so what he gives is a recipe for how to fix the frame. Uh, but here at first order and second order, he's actually talking about spin coefficients and he's not talking about canonical forms. And I'll come back to that. But I think the most important thing is he finds originally that the worst case for an upper bound was in uh, case 3b, where he originally finds that the upper bound is six. Now, whether space times exist that actually embody that, that require six iterations of the Cartan Carlini algorithm. Um, is an, was an open question, but in 96, Ramos, uh, Machamos, Ramos, and uh, Vickers uh, used the GHP formalism. I won't talk about that, unfortunately. Uh, Gerok held Penrose formalism, and they gave an upper bound of five. So they, they cut it down a bit to just five as the worst case. And then myself uh, with Robert Milson and uh, Alan Coley in 2013, we actually showed that the worst case is actually the second nicest case. It only requires three covariant derivatives. And we actually showed furthermore by explicitly integrating out the, the, the um, NP field equations that the upper bound in 3A, the 3A class wasn't five, it was four and it was sharp. So we found a unique class of Kunt waves that require four covariant derivatives. So this is kind of the, the, the strength of the cartan curly algorithm is you can kind of sit down and think about these things kind of symbolically. And then if you're lucky, you can go to the NP field equations and integrate it out and find it. That said, and this is a very open question, over here in case I, we don't know what the upper bound is, if it's five in reality. I, I actually don't think the robinson troutman solutions have been explored at all. Um, so what their upper bound is for the vacuum case, we don't know. Furthermore, if you really want to make a name for yourself, see if you can find another twisting vacuum type N solution. They're, they're very, very tricky to find. Um, it's maybe a quixotic goal, but it, it's an interesting question. Now, I want to come back. I've, I've kind of rambled a little bit. Um, here, a zeroth order, we're using the Petrov classification. And we can think of that in terms of a canonical form. But when we go to first and second order, we're just doing transformations on spin coefficients. And it's not quite what I would call a canonical form. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, again, I have to bring up the slide of the uh, cartan Lee algorithm. So my point is this, is when Q is not zero, um, we, we fix the frame as much as possible using Lorentz transformations, and we do that using canonical forms. And when we go higher, like first covariant derivative and further, we don't quite have canonical forms. And um, I'm gonna repeat myself a little bit more. So one way we can get canonical forms is we can think of operators. So we can treat the Weyl tensor and the Ricci tensor as operators on, on some vector space and, and find canonical forms of the operators. So for example, I can take the Weyl tensor, I can make the self-dual Weyl tensor using a Hodge dual. Uh, so here it is in equation 31, i is just the square root of negative one as you would expect. And this acts as an operator on the six dimensional space of self-dual bivectors. Um, here, I've kind of given the recipe of what a self-dual bivector satisfies. Um, so we just have an operator on a six-dimensional space, um, and it acts in this way in equation 32. So we, we can do what, what Petrov originally did and classify this. Use Segre type to classify all the possible expression, like canonical forms for the self-dual vial tensor as an operator. Now, if the Ricci scalar, uh, tensor rather, uh, it's very clear what the vector space is. It's it's acting on 4D and mapping into 4D. We can see it as as a, as, as a matrix on four-dimensional space. And again, we have Segre type, and that gives us canonical forms. We can work with um, essentially Jordan canonical form. 
Now, my question is this, is let's go to the easiest case, first covariant derivative. Can we treat the covariant derivative of the self-dual vial tensor or the covariant derivative of the Vici uh, tensor as operators on some vector space? The answer is no. Um, we can do things, we can make operators by contracting indices and making something that's even numbered, but there's no natural way just to take it as an object and treat it like an operator. But let's let's go over the different idea here. So if we go back to the vial spinner, and here I've, I've kind of used Collins notation. So I, J, K, L are my spin dyad indices. A, B, C, D are arbitrary indices. Um, we can just count the number of principal spinners we have. So Omicron, let's say. And we can relate these to uh, principal null directions of the self-dual tensor. Um, so now we're talking about tensors. And we have this nice recipe between the self-dual vial tensor and the vial spinner. And here, we can count the number of appearances of our principal spinner that we've identified with Omicron. And we can just consider a boost. We're, we're, we're going to use a boost as a proxy for counting the highest order, or how many copies of Omicron we have. So on the left-hand side, we have spinner world, where we're just doing a real valued boost. Uh, well, um, yeah, a, a spin transformation. And on the other side, we're doing a, a real valued boost. And we just count uh, how many multiples of two we have. So we see here that, well, psi zero transforms with a to the power of four. Psi one transforms with a to the power of two. Psi two doesn't even see a boost and so on. So psi three and psi four, we have negative powers of uh, a. So this is where we're going to go. This is the boost we're going to think of. And we're going to try and milk this for as much as we can. So let's just take an arbitrary tensor, um, so T here. And we see that under an arbitrary uh, boost, again, lambda should be A, but that's OK. Um, we have lambda to some power with indices. And this quantity is called boost weight. And it's essentially counting the number of L's we have. Uh, sorry, the number of N's minus the number of L's. Yes, yes, that's exactly it. Um, so we're, we're just counting the difference. So for example, if I flip back a little bit, the boost weight here is two. Um, I've chosen bad powers. Um, the boost weight here is two. The boost weight on this is one. The boost weight of psi two is zero. The boost weight of psi three is negative one. And the boost weight of psi four is negative two. Just kind of, yeah. And four, we, we can always do this decomposition where using the boost weight, we can write out any tensor as a decomposition this way and just keep track of their boost weight. So here, this T in brackets subscript B is the projection onto the subspace of components of boost weight B. Uh, in the vial tensor or vial spinner, it's very natural. Uh, for other tensors, it, it becomes a little more involved. So again, we, we pick any NP frame we like. We can do this decomposition into boost weight. And we can start thinking of the boost order. So here, that is um, the script B T. And it's a function of L. And I'll say why in a second. So this is the maximum boost weight of a tensor for a given null direction. Um, and it turns out that once you pick your null direction, this number, it's an integer actually, is invariant under boosts spatial rotations and null rotations will L. So when we're changing N and leaving L unchanged. So what this tells us is that the boost order of a tensor is only dependent on the choice of L. It's, it's in kind of, in a sense, the in, an invariant of the tensor and L together. And if we define this bold B to be the, the highest order possible, so it's the maximum over all choices of L. Um, the existence of an L that has a smaller boost order 
then this maximum boost order is an invariant property of the tensor. So if I have a if I have a vial type, a Petrov type N tensor, of course I could choose any frame I like, and I could make it look like it is of a more general Petrov type, like Petrov type I. But there's always a null direction I can pick and an associated NP frame I can pick where it looks like we would expect. So psi zero to psi three or zero and psi four is non-zero. But we're gonna say that this L is T aligned if the boost order is less than the maximum uh, boost weight uh, possible. So it's good here to give an example. And to do that, I'm just gonna talk about uh, the vial tensor and the Ricci tensor. Um, so here we have the boost order as we would expect, as I, as I was talking about earlier. Uh, for the vial tensor, it should be natural at this point from all I've been talking about it. But for the Ricci tensor, we actually have to think about it. And so we have all of these components. And for example, for the boost order zero, we have two components that we have to, or two classes of components we have to keep track of. Uh, so these, don't see boosts, even though they have uh, an L and N direction. And these are purely spatial, so they don't see boosts either. And just, so here, the highest boost order is two. We can actually make an alignment classification from this. For the vial tensor, again, we, we built this kind of with the vial tensor in mind. We have the Petrov type. Uh, so the alignment types for the vial tensor or the Ricci tensor here, they, they both work are given here in equation 42. So if, if our boost order is two, then we have alignment type G. If our boost order is one, we have alignment type I and so on. So over here, we see that for Petrov type or alignment type N, we have that the boost order is negative two. So we only have psi four is the, the largest quantity. There is some null direction where only psi four is non-zero and the rest of the size are zero. And of course, we have the boring case. The alignment type zero is where our tensor, the vial tensor or Ricci tensor is zero. Now, the, the, this is where I have to stop singing the praises of the alignment classification. It's not, it, it's a very coarse classification for the Ricci tensor. It's not enough to reproduce the segre types. And in order to actually get that information, we have to actually analyze the algebra geometric properties of this equation, which is the highest order term of the Ricci tensor um, under a null transformation of O n. And so we actually have to do a little bit of algebraic geometry, which is very crude, you know, talking about polynomials, but we still have to do it. So, but that can be done um, actually in the paper that I cite for the alignment classifications, uh, they, they, they do talk about this. Okay, so um, let's go back to vacuum type M. So for the covariant derivatives, our, our boost order may be greater than two. Our, our maximum boost order or boost weight may be greater than two, pardon me. But alignment types are still actually applicable sometimes. Here I've given you an example where they're not applicable. So I've written down the boost order for each of the components of the first covariant derivative of the vial tensor in the vacuum type n space times. And we can again play around with the transformation rules that we have, but now we can think of these as uh, tensorial transformation rules, not transformation rules of spin coefficients or connection coefficients. And we can actually classify these. We can make a canonical form. And I'm just gonna mention that now. So here's that table again with the adjusted upper bounds. And if we look at the first order uh, conditions and we go back to the previous slide, which I won't slip back to because I have this equation 46, we see that um, in each of the subclasses here, we do have a maximum boost order um, set up. And so this gives us in some sense a canonical form, but it's a very coarse canonical form. Uh, so for example, I cannot differentiate between case I and 2B just by looking at boost order. I need to actually look at the form of the um, vial spinner, its covariant derivative, 
I have to look at the spinner or its corresponding tensorial analog and actually differentiate this. So for example, I can say that, well, in type I, tau is zero. Uh, oh, actually over here in type 2b. Okay, my point is this, this was a bad choice. I should have went with uh, 3a and 3b. Here we can actually differentiate things. So we either have the magnitude of alpha is not proportional to the magnitude of tau, or it is. And that would have an effect on the form of the tensor. So what my issue is that like with the Ricci tensor, the alignment classification is, is too coarse. Uh, to get something finer, we actually have to add additional geometric conditions. So one idea is to include the spin uh, decomposition. So we start considering spin transformations uh, on the spatial part, and that could allow us to classify this even better. Uh, other people talk about discriminant analysis. Um, this is actually still an open question. So this is of interest, not just in four dimensions, but in higher dimensions as well. Um, there's, there's actually a very strong interest in higher dimensional classification because it becomes a lot harder, uh, for example, to do a null rotation and actually solve it. Okay, so just a little bit more. Uh, these are the references that I wanted to include. So I've talked about Colin's uh, paper, um, my own. Um, here, the 2005 Milson Coley Pravda Pravdova's paper is a very good summary of the alignment classification. And then finally, um, Ramos and Vickel's 96 paper that introduces this GHB formalism and applies it to type and vacuum solutions. Um, okay, well, um, that's me. So thank you for your attention. Uh, I really appreciate everyone coming and, and seeing this talk.